Hello, Lee. Hey. Welcome to the Empowerment Series. So every every day I've been interviewing somebody for their qualified perspective during this, this uh, interesting time in our lives where we're seeing a lot of, um, of disempowerment, honestly. Um, let me turn these notifications off. Yeah, so we're seeing a, a, a lot of confusion, uncertainty of what's going to happen and loss of control, which are the ingredients of fear. And with, with that, people are feeling very disempowered. And I wanted to create a series where people can get tangible tools. They can start applying to empower themselves. And uh, we have Lee Nada with us today, who's who's just a very a very sweet human being, and we 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 run in a, a lot of the same circles. And I have seen her her work, and she's she's phenomenal at what she does, which is she works with couples and powerful women to cultivate emotional intelligence and erotic intelligence and she um she holds space and gives people tools for their uh their communication for powerful communication which which improves everything so welcome lee so good to see you it's so great to be here kevin thanks for having me on yeah, the, the main reason I wanted you here is because we're in isolation. We're 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 with you know, and oftentimes with our loved ones, with mm -hmm. our family, with our with our significant others, and we're kind of at a pretty tense moment in uh, in world history. Yeah, a lot of tension in the air. There's a lot of things going on, and. Uh, and, you know, I know from experience, we've just been more on edge than usual. And so I wanted to, to bring you on to talk about some, some tools for empowerment. Absolutely. So I will share things through the lens of the work that I do, which is around intimacy, communication, sexuality. And, you know, one thing that I'd like to comment on first that can provide a helpful lens that you know we can choose to see all of these events through is that um, you know language is really important here and this is something I heard Esther Perel comment on in a recent video that she posted and um, you know what I'm hearing as far as terminology goes is a lot of people are referring to this as a quarantine lockdown social isolation, you know, all of the words that indicate things that have us feeling like animals trapped in a cage. Now, that may be the very feeling that is coursing through our bodies, but my question is, is what could happen? What could change? What could transform if we view this as a cocooning period of time or a place where we are um, incubating and creating? Because I, for me, when I changed my outlook or when I shifted my outlook, that radically shifted how I felt in my body and how it felt to be at home with my partner during this time. I love that. I love that. And that's absolutely true. We are, we are at home and we have the opportunity to create. We're born creators. And so this is a moment where we can cocoon. I love, I love the word you used. Um, it's it's a period of gestation you know this yes. is where we're seeing that so much with with people's creation there's way more people connecting with each other and creating from from their their home it's powerful absolutely absolutely yeah. so i was i was you know you talk about curiosity and that's one of my favorite words in the world <laughs> Uh, because coming from a place of curiosity, especially playful curiosity, um, as far as relationships go, mm -hmm. it's just so powerful to come from that place. So can you speak on that a little bit? 
Yes, and now more than ever, we're finding the opportunity to be curious. And a lot of what I share, a lot of what I apply in my own life and what I share with clients and friends and family members is an alternative lens through which we can see the world. An alternative lens that provides us something outside of the world of suffering that is generally by default. And so when we look at curiosity in this context, um, it may feel given world events that um, all of our shit's coming up. All of the issues, everything that we had pushed under the surface that we were able to distract ourselves, you know, with our day jobs, with hobbies, with going out. Well, we, we no longer have those distractions. And it seems as if everything is coming up now. And so there is a huge opportunity to get curious about what parts of ourselves and what parts of our relationships could use some extra love and attention. And again, language is super key here. So it doesn't feel good in my body, for example, when I say, what do I need to fix about myself? What do I need to fix or change about my relationship? It feels really expansive in my body when I say, what part of my relationship wants some TLC? What part of my internal system, what part of my software wants a software update because I've been avoiding it because I was so busy meeting people for coffee or you know doing something outdoors. And so there is a real opportunity here for us to get curious and start to ask questions around, okay, what part of my relationship would like some extra love and attention? Um, what would like some updating? What can I do a sort of spring clean on? And it's no coincidence that we are also in the season of spring. So there is an opportunity here to get curious about um, what parts of ourselves have gone unattended to that would really love our intention and attention right now. Yeah. And I, I touched on this in the beginning and I really want to dive into to us being in these tight quarters and there's, you know, conflict arises. So let's, let's, Talk about conflict a little bit. Yeah, uh, so I will share first from personal experience that a whole lot of conflict has arisen and what it has caused me to do is innovate. So here's another opportunity for everyone who's listening is yes, does conflict feel challenging in the body? Does it create massive surges of sensation and do we attach that to emotion? Absolutely, because we're humans. And what is the opportunity on the other side of conflict arising? There's a, a real chance for innovation here. And as I was going through all of my stuff that was coming up and all of the stuff in my relationship, I found that I had run out of nearly every tool in my toolbox. All of the things that worked in our old world paradigm were no longer working in these close quarters. So I had to literally create things on the spot. So here's what I have sort of masterminded within myself with the help of my partner and have shared with many others is when we're in these close quarters, the first thing to do when we arrive at a moment of conflict is one, to ensure that everyone involved feels physically and emotionally safe. Now, physically, um, you know, physical safety might be something that's not an issue. Um, emotional safety, however, for many people is something that has been absent their whole lives. And it may seem like something we can logic our way out of, but when we truly feel emotionally safe, that is the place from which we know that we can express our thoughts, our feelings and emotions. And there's a, goody, a pretty good chance that on the other side, our partner would be willing to receive that given the fact that our expression is uh, a conscious expression. Um, and so what was happening for me in these moments of conflict was I would completely shut down. And when in these close quarters, we might find that we go into fight, flight, or freeze. My MO was freeze. And so what I had to do in order to be able to create resolution and come back to love and connection with my partner was I actually had to put my hands on my body and I'd have to pause in our moment of heated debate or conversation and have to ask for a few minutes and say, okay, I'm safe right now. 
I am safe. And having my hands on my body created a really, um, it created a sense of embodied safety for me. Now, I, I generally feel very safe in my relationship, but given the fact that tensions are running so high now, I, I needed to remind myself. So coming back to safety and just reminding ourselves, okay, you're safe, or taking a moment away and then coming back to the conversation at hand when we feel our, our faculties have come back online. Yeah, I appreciate that, especially when we're in those heated states, we're in that sympathetic drive. When we're in that fight or flight place, it doesn't matter. We're in our limbic system and our, right. our frontal cortex isn't, isn't putting the brakes on anything right there. And so creating some space is a is really powerful tool. And, um, you know, it, I think, I think timing is so powerful for this also, like that's not a time to hash things out, to figure things out. Um, so, so another thing you've said is when we're in, is preparing for those, those scenarios. So making, making commitments to each other beforehand. And could you, could you give some examples of that or, or speak more on that? Absolutely. So this is key in being able to resolve conflict quickly and being able to stay on the same page as our partners, which I know that that's what we all want, especially during these times. Um, having a set of agreements that you create with your partner in moments of neutrality and connection so that when conflict arises or when disagreement arises, you have a set of agreements that were already created. So I'll share some examples of the ones that my partner and I created. Um, if we arrive at a moment of conflict and either one of us or both of us doesn't feel emotionally safe to express, or if one of us identifies that either us or the other has gone into sort of the sympathetic drive, then we agree to step away from the situation in that moment. Now. Yes, it feels uncomfortable because the issue hasn't been resolved, but we know given our past experiences that we can't solve the problem from the same place it was created because it's not going to create the kind of resolution and connection that we desire. So we know looking back and gathering data on how we handle conflict, that having an agreement like taking a step away and asking for space um, is, is one way to um, have sort of a, a co-created agreement around how to deal with conflict. Another is committing to asking each other, what do you need? Like, what do you need right now to feel safe? Do you need space? Do you need a cup of water? Do you need a hug? And then going within and asking, okay, what do I need? And how do I communicate that to my partner? And the answer can very well be, I don't know what I need right now. Because many times for me, when my prefrontal cortex goes offline, it's pre-verbal. I'm not forming articulate sentences and I'm not clearly stating my needs. And so when I sense that's happening for me or when he senses that's happening for me, it's what do you need? Okay, why don't you take five minutes? And then I go into my own ritual around placing my hands on my body and I will actually wrap my arms around my body and rub my arms because this brings us back to a whole brain state. And so this can help bring our faculties back online. Um, and I will also say things to myself that a child would wanna hear. For example, you are safe, I've got you, I love you, everything's gonna be okay. So nothing complicated. This is what my inner little girl wants to hear to know that she's safe and that she can go back out and play and Literally what happens in these moments is we have to reparent ourselves. We have to remother and refather ourselves so that our entire being knows that we are safe to interact and engage in coming back to love and connection. I think you're on mute. <laughs> that happens every time. <laughs> yeah. Um... Yes, coming back to loving connection um, when we're in that place, stepping back, taking a moment. And 
building the ability to do that. So you've, you've talked about um, something that I, I, I just love. You brought up, you brought up cold showers. Yeah. So tell me about cold showers and the purpose of cold showers. Okay. So there are a ton of physiological benefits for taking cold showers. And if anybody wants to read more into that, you can study any of the work of Wim Hof. Wim Hof. And he's, oh, yeah. you know, the ice man. Um, here's where, why I use them. Aside from the physiological benefits, something I found was happening when in moments of conflict or approaching conflict, conflict is I would completely shut down. So what was happening in my body was I would surpass fight or flight. I would go directly into freeze. My body secretes chemicals that numb my body because physiologically speaking, my body thinks it's readying itself for death. And because of the intelligence of our bodies, they, they prepare us for such things. Now, while I'm not actually preparing for a physical death, it feels that way in my body. All of my systems shut down, my face goes blank. And the analogy that my partner shared with me, which is so brilliant, for those of you who've been to New York City, you, there's always that one person who, when the train's about to leave the station, they are bolting down the stairs. And as the doors are shutting, they stick their hands in and they try to pry the doors open so they can get onto that train, right? Most I've of us have that. probably, <laughs> have you been that person? I've done that. That's you. That <laughs> okay. So when this, when conflict arises, I am that person. My highest intention outside of, you know, the drive of my ego is to try and be the person who's bolting down the stairs to keep the train doors open. And in my mind, that's akin to keeping my heart open because when I go into freeze mode, everything shuts down and I am completely closed hearted to my partner. Like there's nobody home. And so what I've been doing with cold showers as a, sort of a parallel to keeping my heart open and creating pattern interrupts in my body is I have taken the cold shower and I'll do some really deep diaphragmatic breathing while I'm standing under the cold water. And I will actually imagine keeping the doors of my heart open throughout the, the physiological discomfort in the shower. And what I found happens is as I started to, to keep that practice and I stayed there for about a minute, two minutes, is I would stay there and then all of a sudden I'd have an emotional release. I would just let out tears because this was me saying, you're safe, it's okay. And there was something ready to be released. And so if you're someone who's trying this, don't be alarmed if there's laughter, tears, anger, all sorts of emotion that comes up. I invite you to, to hold space for your own emotion or have someone hold space for you. And then post shower, lay and, and take a little breather, maybe do a meditation. If you can help rushing off to do the next thing, give yourself a few minutes to really be with the experience itself. Nice. Yeah, I actually, I have clients do cold showers as well for similar reasons. Like actually, you know, the, uh, the limbic system and the frontal cortex constantly like the limbic system fires. And if our frontal cortex is skilled at it, it will calm it down a bit and, and is able to be like, okay, you're, you're good, especially with the, your safe piece. And that's okay. why cold showers are awesome means for this because you, you hit the cold shower and what happens? Your limbic system fires and it's like, get out of here. Right. Yep. And then your frontal lobes have to be like, you're safe. It's okay. You're going to be yes. fine. And it, so your frontal lobe tells your limbic system that you're safe and you build the, the, the mnemonic of neuroplasticity is neurons that fire together, wire together. Yes. So we're, we're strengthening that pathway between our frontal lobes and our limbic system, which is really powerful. And um, I've, I, I've never had the intense emotions, but I know that, uh, that um, especially like women have taught this who are like, Forget that. <laughs> like I'm not. I'm not doing that. You know. <laughs> um, but it's it, it's really powerful, and I, I like you know when when it's like there are times when I won't go freezing cold, especially here in Oregon. 
it's cold. It's yeah. really cold. In in Austin, like freezing cold or as cold as it gets is like, yeah, no big deal. Yeah. But uh, but here it's cold. And and I'll do that sometimes when I'm feeling up for it. And this is the other thing I tell clients is like, don't do it if you're like gritting your teeth and like, you know, I got to like stay in here for a little longer, like, and hitting it, there's, there's the bird. We, we have a bird in the house right now that we need to catch because there's five kitties in here. Oh, well, somebody's going to catch it. <laughs> we got to save the bird. So you got it? Nice. Actually, we should show them the bird real quick. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Never mind. Never mind. You got to get it. <laughs> All right, so saving the bird is more important than showing the bird. Totally. But here's just, the bird. There's the bird. Oh, it's, it's oh a, a dark eyed sweet. junko. It's a little spring dark eyed junko. Save the bird. All right. Beautiful. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> where were we? It's like insert ad for oh, ASPCA here. Right. There you go. So as I was saying, um, I was saying, I, if, if you're gritting your teeth and like, oh, this sucks, like the whole time, you're building that neurology to like, right. to like hate the experience. So, and actually it was uh, Scott Carney who, who like did the story on Wim Hof. He, he was like, go in the cold and do it with a smile. Mm-hmm. And when you can do that, and, and that might mean start with what we call Maui cold. Which is like <laughs> kind of lukewarm, you know, like a little colder. And you can start with that and ease your way into that place where yeah. it's like where the whole time you get excited. You're like, ooh, I'm about to go cold. Like it's about yeah. to it's about to like be a rush, you know? Yeah. But yeah, when we can get there, it's it's a powerful thing. Um, I wanted to talk with you about the locations of where we where we you know practice certain things with with our significant other or with anybody really um in these places so when we're in conflict um do we want to do that in our bedroom or in our workplace so uh, most people are doing that these days because everything's melting together um, my partner and I have a strict no conflict in bedroom policy and we honor that policy. Um, and we tend to keep a, a no conflict at the dinner table policy as well. So we have sort of a relegated area of the home where we'll go to have these conversations. And what I love about that is one, you know, if we are mixing where we do all of these things in one place, then we're bound to get the wires crossed and feel quite confused when we can't figure out why we don't wanna have sex in the bedroom or why our body cringes and tightens and constricts when there's the prospect of having sex on the table and we enter the bedroom. Well, if we just had an argument there while laying in bed last night, then our body is associating conflict with bed, conflict with bedtime, conflict with being naked, whatever you know the case may have been. And same thing at the dinner table, especially when conflict arises as we're eating, our body can't digest the food. Mm -hmm. And this creates a whole host of health challenges, especially if that's becoming compounded over time. So what I love about having a special area of the home for that is that that area can become a ritual space. And so this is again, shifting the perspective we have around how conflict, it, how conflict occurs how we handle it, we can shift that perspective from being one of, oh my God, I can't believe I have to deal with this again. This could be the end of things to, okay, we're going into ritual. We're going into ceremony. And as we know, some rituals and ceremonies can feel uncomfortable. You know, some feel great and orgasmic. Others can feel a little challenging because they're stretching us and, and you know, causing us to grow in new ways. And so if we can create an area of the home that's as sacred as the bedroom, as sacred as the dinner table for these kinds of conversations, then we create a new association in our mind and that allows our physiology 
to relax and to get curious, as you were saying, to get curious about what can come of this ceremony or ritual. Yeah, and it's almost like, it's almost uh, excitement for that. It's like, this is where we resolved the last one and we're in that place and it's like, we're gonna resolve this one. You build up these memories. Yeah. And that's, I mean, it's it's so, it's so cool how neurology is everything. <laughs> it's like <laughs> we're twined with everything, but like with our relationships, the mechanisms of our neuroplasticity um, really, really matter to how we're responding to things. Again, mm -hmm. neurons are fired together, wired together. And that has to do with our sensory diet. So what our senses are exposed to and nothing. And when we're in a place, we have a familiar familiarity to that location yep. and that brings up the emotions from from prior experience in that location we're receiving the same sensory stimulation so we're we're remembering that and um and whether it be a perceived threat or whatever it might be so yes, thank you for that. Location so key, and I love the idea of a of a designated place. Um, the workplace is another thing to mm -hmm. avoid conflict in where we work, where we yes. sleep, where we eat, and some people are in like studio apartments. So it makes it it makes it pretty tricky. Do you have suggestions for how to? handle conflict in super tight quarters? Yeah, absolutely. It All it requires is a little creativity. So in those instances, um, reconfiguring the space if it's available or clearing the space. And so what I mean by that, if you're in a studio apartment, then perhaps you clear the table that you're gonna have the conversation at and you can have the conversation there or you clear the carpet that the two of you are going to sit on and you have the conversation there. Um, and then once the conversation is either, you know, put on pause or resolved, then clearing the space with something clearing like Sage or Palo Santo, um, or even setting an intention to clear the space. Uh, and something I love from a physiological perspective, and I would recommend this whether you're in a mansion in the hills or a studio in the city is to do a little shake. Stand up, shake the body, change the physical state because this allows us to shake off any tension our body was holding on to, um, any trauma from past, present that we may have incurred, allows us to create um, more flow and pliability in the body. Um, and then as well for changes of state, I really. I always recommend drinking water after to flush the body, um, using essential oils as a sort of um, uh, another um, uh, sensory anchor. Um, and then, you know, just imagining the space being cleared as well. So if you're working in a, a very small space, doing an energetic clearing of the space and then resetting the space up for work or for dinner, and then really sort of imagine moving from one thing to the next. So there is separation. That's super interesting. You know, so appropriate that we had a bird in here because, you know, when when you shoot at a bird or something, that bird will go to safety and it'll find safety. And then the bird's gonna shake. Mm -hmm. And that's how that's how we deal with, with traumatic experiences in nature is like, shake it off. Um, and this is, this is a TRE, trauma release exercise or tension release exercise, very similar with allowing ourselves to shake because so much of our, of our upbringing is like, don't shake, that's for sissies, like, or yeah. language, like, oh, he's shaking his boots, you know? Right. And like, those are things you don't want to show people um, in, in our society. And so it's really powerful to find the space, shake it off, do some dancing. Mm -hmm. um, dancing's really, really powerful stuff, you know? So um, so I, I, I love this. Uh, one more thing that, that we talked about, or I heard you talk about before, was preparing for when conflict arises. 
Yeah. Um, so tell me, is there a certain direction you want me to go in with that one? Because I can go so many ways. Yeah, right. Um, I, a direction you haven't gone yet. Okay. The, the path less traveled, the road less traveled. Let's see. <laughs> Preparing. Um, hmm. Mm -hmm, hmm. Let me check in. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's what's coming through. Um, here's a practice that I keep every day in my journal and I actually have it right here. So I'm gonna do a little show and tell. Um, this is something that primes me really well for how I decide to create my day. Um, every morning when I journal as a part of my morning ritual, on a post-it, I have six questions. And so in addition to whatever I decide to journal about, I'm always answering these six questions. And some of the questions are, what do you stand for? Or what are you taking a stand for today? How are you committing to yourself, your business and your partnership? What beliefs do you want to reinforce? And you know, those questions might include, you know, if you find yourself in a moment of conflict or challenge, how will you deal with that? Or do you anticipate feeling challenged by anything today? And I love that because the journal that I use, the High Performance Planner, um, asks that question. So I answer that question every single day. And it has me create the space not to, um, you know, sort of foreshadow a challenge, but if I know that I have, you know, a challenging meeting coming up, or if me and my partner are supposed to pick up a conversation from yesterday that has gone unresolved, then it allows me a space to reflect on how I am creating myself to show up in that moment. So having some sort of way to tap into that each day allows us to create ourselves by design versus falling into all of the baggage that we can carry with us around trauma, fears, wounding, um, you know, our parents' relationship dynamics, societal programming, because if left to our own devices and if not, you know, if we're not priming ourselves and creating ourselves newly every day, then we will go back to some of those habits where the neural pathways have been forged for 30, 40, 50 years. And so having that space each morning to decide how we're going to show up, no matter what happens, even if it's in the face of conflict, we get to choose that. And it allows us to more easily tap into that way of being should conflict arise. Such a powerful tool. Yeah. Great. So do you also, and, and, you know, Alex Murphy and I talked about this yesterday, like your journal is your best friend. Like, yeah, I have a journal, get a journal. Yeah. Um, and, and when you put things on paper, when you slow down the rate of your thinking and you create space between your thoughts like that, really powerful things happen and you can list things out way cleaner and um and make sense of things in a much more effective way mm -hmm. so we talked about a morning ritual do you also have a night ritual yes yeah rituals are the thing especially now given the times we're in you know the days can melt together it's like we don't even know what day it is what's happening today so what i love about morning and evening rituals is that they create a container for the day. There's an opening ritual and there's a closing ritual, the way, you know, most ceremonies occur. And so in the evening, a part of my evening ritual is again journaling. And what I'm journaling at the end of the day are things like, you know, something I learned about the day or in the day, something I'm grateful for, what I want to prepare for for the next day, um, how well I showed up in service today. So these are things that as I understand what it looks like to create my life by design, the life that I desire to lead, I answer specific questions as a, as a way to check in on how the day went for me. So evening journaling is a huge part of my routine. Um, I also really enjoy a little bit of evening movement before bed. And that could be a simple stretch, a stretch, a shake, um, making weird sounds. I do it all the time. Just letting anything from the day out and it doesn't even have to be words. So I did this last night. I sort of 
created my own private ritual and whatever sounds wanted to come out, I let them come out. And that was, you know, one of the deepest acts of self-care and self-love I could have granted my body because there were things that were piled up from the day that I didn't want to talk about. I didn't want to get into the intellectual thought process of why something happened or how I'm feeling about it. I just wanted to allow it to express from my body. So being able to empty our vessel at the end of the night in a way like that can also be really supportive. That's beautiful. Yeah. All right. So we've talked about talked about conflict. You've given us so many awesome tools for opening and closing the day in, in a ceremonious fashion and and approaching conflict from a ceremonious way as well, opening and closing, giving a pain and respect to the location. Mm -hmm. I would, uh, I wanted to ask you about connection, like rituals for connecting. There are definitely like moments where it's like, I need, I'm like, I just want to connect. Yeah. And, um, and I, yeah. And I feel like, like, you know, I feel like connection is an essential nutrient for all of us. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to hear some some tools you might have for connecting with a partner. Sure. So I'll share some tools first for connecting with a partner who you're sharing the same physical space with. And that's the situation a lot of us find ourselves in. Um, and some of us find ourselves distant from our partners right now for one reason or another. So when it comes to connection, and really I can say this about anything, anything and everything is sacred from, you know, the argument to making dinner, to eating dinner, to sex, to taking a shower, to taking a shit. It's all, it can all be sacred, it can all be ceremony. Um, and when, when I choose to view things through that lens, it allows me to, the space to slow down and to really honor whatever the process is. Because if not, my tendency is to wanna to check the text message while I'm doing something, to reply to the email, and it just takes the ceremony out of all of it. And it really sucks the presence out of all of it. So when it comes to connection, um, something that I really love doing is scheduling time for it. Now, given the fact that we are sharing physical space with each other these days, it may seem like we're having a lot of time together. And something that I've, I've created in my relationship and that I've you know, supported a lot of clients with is creating, first of all, time to connect with self. Time to connect with self is going to be the thing that supports us in genuinely connecting with our partners. Because if we're not leaving any time for ourselves, then it's likely that our needs are going unmet and that resentment can grow from that because we've lost our sense of autonomy, which we had just a few months ago. And so taking the time to maybe go into a separate bedroom, go for a walk, you know, let the other person know you're gonna sit and do a meditation and really create that inner sanctuary. That is, you know, first and foremost. Um, and making that a ritual or a ceremony as well that happens on a regular basis, if not every day. And then creating that time with your partner. And so what, the way me and my partner have configured things throughout this time is we have an office and we have a separate workspace you know, in the main living area. And so we're doing our own thing during the day. And we see each other in passing and we sort of catch up at the water cooler, the metaphorical water cooler, as it were. <laughs> um, and then our time is having dinner together. And so it doesn't matter what we're doing throughout the day. We know that when we come together, all devices are off and we're creating time for connection. Um, and outside of that, if one of us happens to have a meeting during dinner, then we schedule time. And we honor that time as if we're honoring a meeting with a client. And what I love about scheduling time for connection, and this can even be time for sex, time for intimate connection, is that it allows us the space to prepare for it. So when we have, and I, I use a lot of business concepts in my relationship and in how I support others in their relationship, because there are many business practices that are tried and true and they work to keep businesses alive. So why wouldn't we take those best practices to keep our relationship alive and thriving? 
And so one of the practices I take is scheduling time because unless, you know, you and your partner are in the habit of um, being spontaneous and adventurous, especially when spending 24 seven together, that time can sort of dissolve away and things become mundane. And so when we schedule time together, the way we would schedule an important meeting with an investor, we prepare accordingly. We put on our best, we make sure we prepare our meeting notes before the meeting and we show up you know, with the right foot forward. And so when we have that time scheduled, it gives us something to look forward to. We get to be excited for it throughout the day or throughout the week. And then we get to prepare for it. We get to say, okay, you know what? I wanna style my hair this way, or I wanna write this special note before this intimate meetup. And it allows us to bring our best selves forward, which is what creates connection because now it's connection out of choice versus connection out of obligation or quarantine. That's good. That's good. <laughs> we, and we often have like, you know, a like, no, I'm not scheduling with you, like kind of mentality with things like, no, we're, we're partners, like, you know, uh, we just, we, we have spontaneous things and that's, that's how we do it. But I think you're absolutely right with, with having, bringing business practices to relationship and not having it be super taboo and like, you know, um, feeling like it's work, you know, just because it's business related does not mean it's work. Yeah. And here's the thing. I mean, if anybody can sit there and say a relationship is not work, I'm like, you know, I don't know what relationship you're in because relationships require love and energy, attention, intention, effort, and, and they bring about lessons learned and discomfort and growth and expansion and connection and all the things. So, you know, in my, in my personal opinion and in my personal experience, the moment I recognized that I could take best practices in business and apply them to my relationship, that skyrocketed our relationship. And some of the things that we apply are having a shared mission and vision right? Because do you go into a successful business and do you think that they're just spontaneously popping into each other's offices? Like, Hey, Chuck is now a good time. We can talk about, you know, this quarter's earnings. No, they schedule that meeting so that everybody can come prepared. And that's why they're successful because there's constant communication. There is, uh, you know, there are shared missions and values. There is a vision. There is a plan. So businesses have plans. They have a one-year plan, a three-year plan, a 10-year plan. My partner and I have created the same thing. And you can get creative. It doesn't have to follow a business plan guideline, but have fun with it. Like, where do you see yourself traveling to with your partner over the next 10 years? What kinds of food do you want to be feeding your body? Um, what kinds of sex do you want to be having? What do you want your financial health to look like? What do you want your physical health to look like? And this can be a really fun co-creative process that one gives you pause to think about what you really want for yourself, gives your partner the same pause, and then lets you co-create that in your relationship. And it becomes this living, breathing document and entity that supports the growth of your relationship. And why wouldn't we want to set ourselves up for success? Yes, yes. And why... I mean, it's, it's always a collaboration, you know, mm -hmm. you, you have to be a cooperative, collaborative endeavor yeah. in relationships. Uh, I mean, so many, so many connections are being made right now. So <laughs> thank you so much. It's awesome. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to, you'd like to add? Hmm. Yes. This is a perspective that I've been taking on that if it feels good for anyone who's listening and watching to take on, I totally invite you to it um, because times are changing right now and things do not look the way they used to. And 
you know, my prediction is that things won't really ever look the same again. We're going to create a new normal. And that is going to turn out however we create for it to turn out. So here's a perspective that I've been trying on that's really supported me during this time. And this is sort of a bigger picture, is that we are going through a collective rebirth right now. And when you think of a birthing process, which is also a very deep, sacred ceremony and ritual, what happens during that process? There is an incubation process in which the baby is forming inside the mother's womb. And in order for that baby to survive, we have to nurture it. We're not just eating for ourselves anymore. We're eating for two. We are nurturing our bodies with, you know, hopefully the most nourishing food and beverage that we can have access to. And, you know, now is the time to do the same thing more than ever, to nourish our bodies, to nourish our minds. So being really mindful of what we're consuming, food-wise, beverage-wise, media-wise, content-wise, all of the ways in which we consume, asking, is this consumption really supporting my growth and expansion? Because we have an opportunity now more than ever to grow and expand as individuals and as a collective. And what I posit we are experiencing right now are labor contractions. This can be um, a very interesting time for people. And I see that we're experiencing that as a collective and many of us as individuals are also experiencing huge amounts of internal growth and shift. And we can choose to sit in the cold shower, gritting our teeth and saying, oh God, I just, I'm gonna really try and rough it through this. Or we can choose the perspective of, okay, how can I allow a smile to turn up on my lips right now? How can I allow my body to feel at ease? How can I get curious about what's happening within and what's happening around me so that I can have a more pleasant time because the things are happening around me. Nothing's gonna change that at the moment. How can I create um, a supportive internal state for myself and my loved ones so that we can really make the most of this experience and create and rebirth in a way that feels regenerative for everyone. Yes, that's. I, I think that's one of your superpowers is perspective and lens. Thank and you. Giving people other ways to think about stuff um, or conflict, whatever it might be. Um, you know, I I I often speak about the power of perspective. Like mm -hmm. when I was, you know, in the hospital, breathing through a tube, eating through a tube, couldn't eat, walk or talk, left hand totally flexed inward, shifting that perspective from like, mm -hmm. this sucks, because it did suck, but also yeah. choosing this is an adventure. And that's, that, that's applicable no matter where we are. You know, we're in this place, and anytime we're like, this sucks, we can shift that and be like, this is an adventure. Adventure sucks sometimes. It's totally like not far fetched. Yeah. But they get better. And there's, there's, I, I joke, I said, there's no pirate movie that's all yo ho ho and a bottle of rum. Right. We gotta, have, we gotta have some, some ups and downs with it. And the perspective that you, that you have brought about many things about, about um, reframing different aspects of our of our relationship and taking this moment as an opportunity, um, an opportunity to create the gestation period for us to grow. So thank you so much, Lee. Where can people learn more about you? My pleasure. Um, so people can learn more about me and the work I do at untamedintimacy.com. Um, super excited to see you all there. I've got uh, plenty of um, resources to share with anyone who is looking for uh, deeper connection and intimacy during this time with self and with others. And then of course you can find me on Facebook, just search Lee Noto and on Instagram, same thing. Perfect, perfect. Well, thank you so much, Lee. Um, you know, well, I, I know you're, you're in Austin now, so we'll be, We'll be hanging out soon. Yes, I look forward to it. Likewise, thanks so much. Awesome, Kevin. Adios, and everybody, thank you.